war on Saddam Hussein. A British attack helicopter is trapped in the gun sights of an enemy tank. The hunter becomes the hunted. He's cat and mouse. Yeah, I'm just trying to hide in a featureless terrain where there's nowhere to hide. The only chance for survival is to turn the tables. If you don't see the enemy, you, you'll be shot down. And when the hide and seek is over, the final duel in the desert can begin. March 20th, 2003. The United States lay siege to Baghdad and the regime of Saddam Hussein. British forces sweep into Iraq from the south. Their objective, the second city of Basra. 5,000 troops and up to 50 Iraqi tanks defend the southern suburbs. Hidden among buildings and palm trees, the tanks pose a lethal threat to British ground troops. In the desert south of the city, the British are in constant danger of Iraqi counterattack. But their own heavy tanks, rushing across the desert from Kuwait, have still to reach the front line. With fixed wing jets focused on Baghdad, a single unit provides air support for British troops. 847 Naval Air Squadron. Just 12 helicopters to stop 50 tanks. At Camp Viking, 80 kilometers from Basra in the Kuwaiti desert, senior pilot Andrew Clark coordinates operations. Quite apparent that we were a bit of a thin red line trying to hold back a threat that we didn't really know the full scale of. With British reinforcements on the way, March 24th is the last chance for Iraqi tanks to counterattack. We looked at the numbers we had. It didn't seem to be an awful lot to counter a division of, uh, of armor coming our way. The day will see the heaviest fighting in 847 Squadron's history. A day of reckoning for one young pilot, Lieutenant Commander Jim Newton. Jim Newton, the, the AP Aviation Patrol Commander, actually overslept. So at about four o'clock in the morning local time, I had to go and find him, wake him up. Morning, Mr. Newton. Are you joining so us? So I was woken by my very friendly senior pilot with a torch and a friendly jolt to say, come on, Scoobs, you're airborne in 20 minutes. My attack call sign is Scooby, as in Scooby-Doo, haven't got a clue. And I got it, rather unfortunately, for getting lost in a five ship. I was number five in, in a formation of five helicopters, and I got separated from the lead. It's pretty difficult to do. With 12 years training, Newton is a highly capable officer. But this will be his first time in combat. The second I woke up, there is the realization that I'm, I'm here. You can hear rounds in the distance. It's baking hot. You can see the links over the road with missiles on it. Eight four seven Squadron's attack helicopter is the Westland Lynx, the fastest helicopter in the world, and highly maneuverable. Thanks to a groundbreaking rotor system, it can execute barrel rolls and even loop to loop. For the assault on Basra, it's armed with four armor piercing anti tank missiles. The Lynx flies in tandem with a Westland Gazelle, which has no heavy weapons of its own. Its two man crew provide extra eyes to find and identify enemy targets. 
Tension is high in the operations tent. Jim Newton leads the first crew into action. There is a feeling of um, next up to the uh, face the firing squad, if you like. And there were some pretty anxious faces around the, uh, the camp. That, that walk out to the aircraft was always about thinking about the mission and thinking about what you're about to do, just playing it out in your head, how you'd react to things. Newton, as mission commander, takes the left-hand seat in the Lynx. He will navigate, operate the radios, and locate the enemy in his missile sights. Yeah, OK, sight's fine. Yeah. If necessary, he will launch the attack himself. The youthful commander is paired with one of 847's oldest and wisest heads. Colour Sergeant Darby Allen is an unflappable pilot. After 28 years in the Royal Marines, he brings combat experience to the cockpit. I've been through um, all the 70s and the 80s of Northern Ireland, so um, used to a few bombs and bullets going off around us, which, again, doesn't make you immune, but um, I think you, you know what to expect um, a little bit more than the guys who probably hadn't experienced it. I like to think he left me to get on with the flying, and I left him to get on with the commanding. The machine gunner is Marine Louis Harvey Jones, AKA Guns, a man of few words. Big Marine, very quiet guy, um, quiet nature, just sat in the back, um, got on with the job, basically. With any outfit going to war, you need a, a broad spectrum of characters. If you're all steady by the book, then nothing will get done. If you're all young blades out to get involved, then Possibly everyone will get killed, so there needs to be a balance struck. Lifting. The crew faced danger from the outset. Every desert takeoff is a blinding sandstorm. They could be killed before they even leave the ground. Okay. On his first foray into combat, Jim Newton is nervous. Fully fueled, the Lynx is at maximum fighting weight. There are heavy sand filters to protect the engine, a general purpose machine gun, and a battery of four missile launchers. To get all this weight off the ground, the rotors create a huge downwash kicking up a dense cloud of sand. With visibility close to zero, the pilot can easily become disoriented. So in training, the modern Navy leaves the ocean for the desert. This is Watts Air Base, just outside Tucson, Arizona. Jim Newton is now one of the Navy's senior training officers. He's about to show why heat and sand call for special techniques. What we're about to do now is just take off in this uh, dusty desert environment. On his first attempt, the pilot will try to climb straight upwards until he's clear of the sand cloud. But in the searing desert, there's a risk of blowing the engine by overheating it. On the temperature gauge, red for danger begins at 645 Celsius. Two engines on the links. So we need to see, and we need not to go over the maximum limit, which today is 645 continuous, or 665 for a couple of minutes. And obviously, coupled with that, we've got the dust outside. So here we go. Straight up. Good reference. Power's Good coming reference. in. You can see the dust cloud building in front. 630, 640. The engine's about to hit maximum temperature. Power's coming in. There's 645. Come to the top. We're about 25 feet. No higher. Doesn't want to climb anymore. I'm not going to clear the top of the cloud. 
The pilot must abort the takeoff. The aircraft comes back down and says, I ain't going to do that. In desert heat, the Lynx doesn't have enough power to rise straight up and out. The solution is to hover just above the ground. This slows the vertical speed of the downwash, which makes the rotor blades more efficient. As if hovering on a cushion of air, the pilot moves forward instead of up. The horizontal airflow provides extra lift to get airborne using less power. As long as you keep that cushion until you get forward momentum, the aircraft will use less power than what you'd need if you went vertically. But flying straight into the cloud takes nerve. In simple terms, taking off completely blind. Camp Viking, Kuwait. Jim Newton enters the theatre of war. It was like the, the drawing of curtains on reality in many ways. You know, when I came through that dust cloud, I thought to myself, this is it and this is it for real. For the first time in my life, there's a chance I possibly wouldn't come back. They have enough fuel for a 100-minute mission. But danger appears after just 15 seconds. And it isn't the Iraqis. Every weapon sensor Western allies had was trying to see who I was and what I was. American radar has locked on. The Lynx thinks it's under attack. So I had all these lights and, and noises through my headset telling me that there was these weapon systems locking on to me. I've got systems on the aircraft that tell people I'm a, I'm a friendly aircraft. They give all sorts of information about who I am and what I'm up to. But for the best will in the world, you'd never believe they're working. Newton must wait for the Americans to give him clearance. And it was always in a southern drawl, I remember. Yeah, one Charlie, seven of ever go. You're all clear to proceed. Have a nice day now. <laughs> to avoid friendly fire, the Lynx and Gazelle must stay in safe air corridors. They move into formation and into Iraq. Jim Newton's baptism of fire begins. We were not hanging around. I remember we crossed the border at about 130 knots. 240 kilometers an hour. Pilot Darby Allen heads for Basra, skimming the desert at just 10 meters. No matter how low you are, you just want to be lower because you feel totally exposed. It's a flat, barren landscape. In Jim Newton's sights, the scorched aftermath of earlier battles. You smell the oil, and you could smell the cordite in the air from explosions. I distinctly remember seeing my first dead soldier. It's, it's an awful lot to take in, in 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 two minutes. Your eyes are not big enough. The border zone, 32 kilometers from Basra, has seen fierce Iraqi resistance. Iraqi armor, old Russian armor. It wasn't a pretty mix, if I'm honest with you. Newton knows the battle for Basra itself will be even more desperate. Up to 50 Iraqi tanks are hiding somewhere in the buildings and palm trees. If they break out and counterattack, Newton's Lynx is the only shield for the frontline British troops. If a tank comes 30 mile an hour down a road firing 12.7 rounds into Royal Marines, who are lightly armed, only in Land Rovers, the, the whole thing can change on us, you know, in a moment. The Iraqi's main battle tank is the T-55, built in the former Soviet Union. 
Crispin Swain is a former captain in a British tank regiment, trained to fight Russian T-55s in the days of the Cold War. T-55 is essentially the Kalashnikov of tanks. It was designed right at the end of the Second World War and it still sees service today. And that's mainly because it's so effective. The T-55 is the ideal vehicle for a fast-moving counter-attack. Its purpose? To overwhelm the enemy with sudden, massive firepower. The main weapons? A heavy caliber machine gun and a turret mounted main gun to launch heavy shells up to 16 kilometers. But every flash of the muzzle can give away the tank's position. A good tank commander plays a deadly game of hide and seek. So imagining this is the woods just outside Basra, and these are the palm trees here that I'm on the edge of, looking out across desert, and that is flat. Putting your tanks out there is essentially suicide. The enemy's got air superiority. You're waiting for the recce screen to arrive, which is small tanks supported by helicopters. Taking on the tanks, sure, that can, that's very doable. But the helicopters, if you're seen, it's basically game over. In open desert, a tank is easy meat for the Lynx's missiles. <laughs> but Iraqi commanders learned their lessons from the 1991 Gulf War. A battle-hardened veteran stays out of sight and waits his chance to break out in force. The palm trees of southern Basra give dense cover. The suburban buildings a warren of makeshift hiding places. If you're lucky, you might have some other kind of structure that you can put over the tank, because it puts out quite a big heat signature. And of course, with the battlefield being so advanced these days, your heat signature can be picked up from a great distance. Solid walls give added safety a place for tanks to hunker down before unleashing a devastating counterattack. Out in the desert, the vulnerable British troops need air support. But above them, Jim Newton's two helicopter patrol does not have freedom of movement. They must stay inside a battle box of just four square kilometers. If they stray outside, they risk being shot down by friendly fire. Newton focuses the hunt for tanks on southern Basra, dead ahead. We, at this point, we're just maneuvering around our four kilometer box as an aviation patrol, scanning in the 12 o'clock up towards Basra. Newton checks his thermal sights, looking for a telltale hot engine. The tanks are only six meters long, in 40 square kilometers of trees and buildings. After 55 minutes, more than halfway through the mission, there's no sign of any T-55s. When you're looking into the heat haze about four kilometers in front of you, maybe even more, you know, they're difficult to spot at the best of times. Newton's attention is focused ahead, so someone has to cover the rear. Guns is tracking our six o'clock with the GPMG. I got the gazelle as well behind me and the crew in that. The T-55s are too well hidden. They know the ground. They dig the tanks in. All you'll see is just the end of a barrel. It's virtually impossible. Below the links, five British Army scimitars join the hunt. These are fast, highly mobile tanks designed to flush out the enemy from their hiding places. But in a head-to-head -head contest, a lightweight scimitar is no match for a T-55. The scimitar is essentially a reconnaissance vehicle. 
It's not meant to engage. It has its cannon really as self-defense, but essentially it's the eyes and the ears of the commander. That's why it's out front of the main part of the army. Suddenly, the scimitars come under fire from a T-55's machine gun. One of the guys spoke to me on the radio. Uh, I could just hear in his voice, I could hear the rounds hitting his vehicle, or at least ricochets. Now, the British soldiers fear a knockout punch from the heavyweight main gun. A T-55 round hitting the side of a, or the front even, of a scimitar, and there really wouldn't be much left of it. Camp Viking, senior pilot Andrew Clark feels the calls for backup. In terms of radio traffic, people would like to say they kept it calm and um, concise uh, and professional, but there was an element of panic in some of the early uh, transmissions we received. There was rounds landing all around them. I could hear his engine revving over the, you know, the radio as he, as he said to me, you need to, you need to, you need to get here and, and help. Newton must find the tank and figure out the best way to destroy it. This is the core of 847 Squadron's training, originally intended for European battlefields. The ideal tactic is to hide behind hills or trees, then pop up to spy on targets. If there are friendly jet fighters nearby, the Lynx commander can call in an airstrike. On a training mission in the Arizona desert, Jim Newton shows how effective this can be. The fighter is an A-10 tank buster. The Lynx guides the pilot onto the target, an abandoned truck. The jet's inbound now, 450 miles an hour, coming down from 15,000 feet. The jet pilot gets clearance to fire. He's been cleared hot. All he's got to do now is overfly the Lynx helicopter, and then he'll continue with the final part of the reef. March 2003, the outskirts of Basra. Under attack by an Iraqi tank, British troops are desperate for air support. Yep. At 847 Squadron, senior pilot Andrew Clark weighs the options. Have we got any um, fast jet support, fast air to attack um, these these tanks from the uh, from the air? Have we got anything on the ground that could, could help? Any heavy artillery? That wasn't in position at that stage. Jets were all tied up prosecuting depth targets around Baghdad. So it was apparent within a minute and a half of arriving there that 847 was it. With no jets available, Newton must find the tank, then use his own missiles to take it out. But in the desert, there's nowhere for a helicopter to hide. Newton thinks he's the predator. In fact, he's the prey. It scares the hell out of you, it really does. That's a shell and it's landed, you know, a couple of, a couple of meters away. As soon as we saw the first explosion, uh, I just threw the aircraft off to one side to get it away, because um, obviously after the first one, you can expect a few more coming your way. And, and because you don't know where it's coming from, and you don't know when the next one's coming from, you can't see them, you can't hear them. And I was sitting there thinking, I'm going to die. For the first time in his life, Jim Newton is under fire. It's the white flash. 
Christ, that is just right in front of me. A hidden Iraqi tank is pounding the links with shells. The compression wave would hit the aircraft and it would buck. And you'd think to yourself, are we still going? Are we still airborne? The first few shells explode on the ground, dangerously close. You get a big geezer of sand. Then it's like someone throwing stones over the aircraft. One moment which I'll take to my grave is the, is the rounds impacting in front of the aircraft and walking towards me. To Newton's horror, the unseen enemy is calmly finding his range. When you move, the, 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 the rounds impacting the sand change direction following. One round would land in the proximity of the aircraft, then the next one would be a lot closer. So um, the guy firing the rounds, he, he was basically bracketing us and he was getting very good at it. Going for the kill, the tank commander switches to air burst, a massive mid-air explosion of flag. The helicopter itself, it's not designed to take fire and to take hits. Built for speed, the Lynx has no heavy armor. The outer skin is just seven millimeters of aluminium. You need fuel and weapons, you don't need armor. Our tactics are based around the fact that we were lightly protected. If they're shot down, the Iraqi battle tanks will be free to move out of Basra and into open desert. The lightly armed British ground troops face carnage. With 18 minutes of fuel before they must return to base, Lynx and Gazelle go into a standard evasive maneuver. So we were agile around the battlefield and we changed our tactics to make us a smaller target as possible. The tactic is called Hamster Rat and it's supposed to work like this. Circling the battle box, the hamster radios what he sees. Right of tower, low building. Clump of trees, possible target. But it's hard to tell. When he hits the front of the box, the hamster must turn away. Now the rat, half a lap behind, picks up the search. Tower, low building, trees, tank identified. Both helicopters keep moving at high speed, making difficult targets. Or at least, that's the theory. The trouble is, in real life, they can't find the tank. Newton focuses on the most likely hiding place. The trees and buildings of southern Basra. The tank keeps up a heavy barrage. But in two whole circuits under fire, neither hamster nor rat sees any telltale muzzle flashes. Newton switches to an incredibly risky tactic, the split maneuver. So we joined up as a pair at this point. We flew towards on what we thought was a threat line. And then when we got to the top of the box, we both turned in different directions. So we're basically saying to the enemy, pick one. Lynx and Gazelle head side by side for the tree line, drawing fire. When the tank commander fires at one helicopter, the other should see his muzzle flash. He chooses the Lynx. The threat to him was the Lynx with tow missiles. It's an anti-tank weapon, and he would know that's the threat he needs to take out first. But neither helicopter sees a thing. trying to observe something that's probably over a mile, nearly two miles away with a naked eye. Never going to happen. Um, Jim was in the site, uh, frantically trying to find the target. We set up our, our hamster rat technique. We'd done split manoeuvres to try and get him to pick one of us, which he did. Uh, and I just couldn't see where it was coming from. 
They have enough fuel for 12 more minutes before they must turn back. That would leave British troops with no air support against rampaging Iraqi battle tanks. I was just about out of ideas, if I'm honest. The mysterious enemy is making full use of his biggest weapon, home field advantage. Former tank commander Crispin Swain explains. A good tank commander will make good use of the ground. He'll have wrecked it beforehand, maybe climbed out on foot, got his binos out, even walked out into the desert to look back and see what the position might look like from out there where the enemy's coming from. If he knows his stuff, he will have wreckied routes and other defensive positions from which he can observe and then pull forward and engage the enemy as he wishes. Once you've fired a couple of rounds, then you'd want to be changing position. Because otherwise, you're going to have everyone looking at you. So you pull back off the position, hopefully into some kind of dead ground. You then move along through the dead ground, and tanks will always try and follow dead ground. That means ground that's not going to skyline you, not going to silhouette you against the sky, because that makes a much easier target to see. Using these tactics, the elusive tank commander could be moving undetected all over southern Basra. He seems to have the helicopters covered wherever they go. You're in a big vibrating noisy box that you can't hide from anybody, can be heard from miles away. So um, you're presenting uh, quite a big target, open target to the enemy. The only advantage you have is to keep low and to keep moving and keep moving fast. But Darby Allen has a problem. There's a limit to how fast any helicopter can go. With a fixed wing aircraft, the fast flow of air over the wings creates the lift it needs to stay airborne. But a hovering helicopter creates lift on the spot by spinning its rotors through the air, like rotating wings. It's not so simple when the helicopter's moving forwards. On one side, the blade's heading into the wind, so there's a bigger airflow and more lift. But on the other side, the blade is moving with the wind, so there's much less airflow and much less lift. If the helicopter goes too fast, the imbalance sends it out of control. So the Lynx manufacturers came up with a revolutionary rotor design. This is built for speed. I mean, the blades that you've got here are composite main rotor blades. They're specifically designed for high-speed flight. The blades are advanced composites of carbon and glass fibre. Tough, but highly flexible. Conventional rotor hubs have hinges, allowing the blades to flap up and down. On the advancing side, where lift is higher, the rotors flap up, which reduces the lift. On the retreating side, they flap down, increasing the lift. So flapping restores the helicopter's balance. But the Lynx goes one step further. The rotor hub has no hinges. The blades are strong enough to flap just by bending, so they're highly responsive and the tips are designed to cut through the air with maximum efficiency. The hingeless hub and advanced blades make the Lynx supremely agile. You're gonna go right up to the envelope of the aircraft. I mean, we backflip the Lynx, you know, other people don't do that. In 1986, the manufacturers flew a highly modified Lynx in speed trials. 
They fitted specialized high-power engines, boosting power by 45%. The Lynx clocked an average of just over 400 kilometers an hour, a world record that still stands. In Iraq, high-speed technology gives pilot Darby Allen a fighting chance. We'd move left and right, um, change height as well. If you go from high to low, it's very difficult for a guy observing to actually get a, a range estimation on you. So you're just trying to confuse him, basically. The Lynx bucks and swoops in the confines of the battle box. fuel, Mission Commander Jim Newton has eight minutes left. Then he must head back to Kuwait. You feel this huge responsibility. Someone's shooting at you, they're all over us with rounds, and, and I can't see them. You, it, very quickly, you, you, you start running out of options, but you can't. You've got to keep going. You've got to keep trying to find it. We were scanning frantically. During an engagement, the inside of a T-55 would be an extremely busy place. Hot, really cramped. There would be the commander trying to locate enemy positions through the dust, through the heat, through the smoke, through the sound of warfare. He'd be trying to engage the enemy, see where it's at, and lay the gun onto that position. At which point the gunner takes over. And he's got more magnified sights, so he'd be able to see more clearly what the, what the enemy target is. So all the time the commander's thinking, have I got enough time to get another round up the spout and fire another round at the enemy, or do I move? what's the most effective thing come to do. On, so from the commander's point of view, it's a really, really stressful time. The T-55 commander fires with everything he's got, a shell every eight seconds. I got feeling, as he adjusted his rate of fires, that he figured I had seen him. The fact I hadn't meant that my life was becoming ever shorter. the operations tent, senior pilot Andrew Clark briefs the next patrol. To protect British ground troops, he must keep a lynx over the battlefield, even if Newton is shot down. So yeah, everything is going through your mind at the same time. You've got friends on the, uh, at the sharp end being fired at. If they were hit, you're going to be you know, worried for them, but also who would be the next up? When would they be ready to go? What would we tell them in terms of the threat they had to face? Newton has fuel to hunt for just five more minutes. Jim couldn't see the target. I couldn't see the target. I was too busy trying to avoid the rounds and fly the aircraft. The guy in the back, he, he has that little bit of extra and he will probably pick up what's going on outside the aircraft quicker than the guys in the front who are obviously really preoccupied um, with their jobs. And the gunner just said, um, boss, I've just seen a muzzle flash. And it's like someone saying, Jim, you've just won the lottery. Because it felt like that. Because a muzzle flash is is what it's all about. That's what I was looking for. But Newton has a shock in store. The tank commander isn't where he's supposed to be. Instead, he's crawled unseen through dead ground, from Basra in the north to the town of az in the west. The buildings make excellent cover, and the lynx makes a perfect side-on target in his sights. Surprise is very much the element of the game in the desert. 
the tank commander had uh, flanked us, basically. You know, I hate to say it, but that's what he'd done. He'd obviously got out around through my nine o'clock, my left-hand side, as I was looking, facing up towards Basra. He knew his terrain, and he knew how to fight a battle with aircraft. My door gunner got eyes on for me. He described where he saw the muzzle flash. We maneuvered the aircraft, turned it through 90 degrees, and I'm looking through the sights, and he's talking me on from the buildings. Just as he's talking, there's a little white flash. The muzzle flash actually was, was a great relief because then I had something to focus on. But equally, that I could have been that particular muzzle flash might have been the end. That muzzle flash means there's a nine kilogram warhead traveling at Mach 2 towards you. And of course, then seconds later, there's another explosion, probably about 75 meters now. Resourceful tank commander is still one step ahead. His hiding place puts Newton under immense pressure. The guy was good. It was a single story building, and, and what gave it away for me was the fact there was a small playground. The tank is in the grounds of a school. He knew our rules of engagement would prevent me firing and uh, he made that opportunity his own. He'd reverse the tank through the wall. He would then come out of the school, fire, and then go back into the school. Newton must make sure there are no children in the area. And of course, I'm just seeing something at huge distances for a fleeting second through smoke and heat haze. A muzzle flash, you know, am, am, am I sure? He switches to high magnification. Then the thermal sight. There's no sign of life. I can pull the trigger now, thank God. It's finally arrived, this moment can come. The final duel is about to begin. Low on fuel, Newton has just three minutes left to destroy the tank. His weapon, the tow anti-tank missile, designed to penetrate heavy armor. Maximum range, 3.75 kilometers, and Newton thinks the tank is just within reach. Before Newton can fire, pilot Darby Allen must bring the Lynx to a stable firing position, then hold it. So that entailed us basically um, slowing down, coming into more or less a static position, which uh, isn't a nice position to be. The missile flew, Darby starts the clock and he counts. Five. As the missile flies, it spools out a fine copper filament. Newton keeps the tank in the crosshairs, directing the missile by wire. It takes 24 seconds. It's a long time. It's a long time when someone's firing at you, because okay. I can see him, he can see me. The Lynx is a sitting duck. And at that point, I saw a muzzle flash. And I remember thinking to myself, both the rounds are going to be crossing in the air. And for a split second, I try to think, well, which one will be quicker? It's the shell. The missile is still on its way. Holding the crosshairs on the, on the front of the tank, don't forget he's moved back into the building. And then when he said 24, 
when he five, and the missile just barely flopped into the sand in front of him. There was this feeling of like, you know, that's it. That's, you've blown it. You've, that's it. You've had it. And uh, I could just feel it around. I mean, the whole bloody patrol you had this kind of, you know, Christ, he's missed. Newton has misjudged the range. And now he's got one minute of fuel left. I selected another missile, and I said, well, we're going to have to go for run and shoot. This time he plans to fire on the move. Distance, three kilometers and closing. You present a much more difficult target if you're moving. So moving towards the target gave him a chance to calm down, assess the situation, and fall back on the training he'd had. The running shot was to shorten the distance. And if I'm honest with you, it was just to try and put this all to bed, just to get it done, to get this resolved. At the controls, Darby Allen knows he's flying straight down the barrel of the tank's main gun. It is quite disconcerting when you're running in at quite a great rate of knots towards the target that's uh, already shooting at you, because all you're doing is just making it easier for him, basically, uh, as you're getting closer. action bar, pull the trigger. I just held the crosshairs on the tank the whole time and I just waited and waited and waited and, and just prayed. And it seemed to take an eternity and it was like frame by frame. That's how it felt. could have only been seconds, but your senses become incredibly heightened. It was just like a little white puff in the side. Then a Catherine wheel, sparks coming out from under the turret. That was it. Have to say anything? We just, we just, I puffed my cheeks out. I think, and he did the same back to me as if, so you know, a bit, a bit, a bit of a close one, Jimbo. Right line. He held his hand up for me, and uh, it was visibly shaking. And he said, "Look at my hands." And I just took his hand and I shook it, and um, I said to him, "You're doing a great job. Carry on." The realization of what he just done was actually starting to sink in then. And I gave, a, I looked over my shoulder to, to, to give the look, I suppose, to guns. And he just kind of looked at me, see, yeah, no bother, boss. As if it was a normal day for him. In fact, the crew's mission begins the fiercest day's fighting in the history of 847 Squadron. This sort of was a line in the sand for us. We, we knew we could get through that day as intense as it was, so whatever else they could throw at us, we could handle just as well. After 11 days in total, the squadron's helicopters destroy 43 major targets around southern Basra. The only sense of elation was that we hadn't lost anyone. Nobody had been shot down, nobody had been injured, and we hadn't lost any aircraft. Jim Newton comes under fire many times as the British finally win control of the city. But it's the tank commander he faced on his first combat mission whom he can never forget. If I could have, I probably would have said to him uh, a huge amount of respect because I was so close to getting shot down by him. And uh, he fought bravely and, and, and well, I guess. I feel lucky. <laughs> 